Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Kevin Jaquies. I'm director of university residences at the University of North Carolina, North Alabama. Jeez, I'm in North Carolina and I've already moved to uh, uh, schools. And uh, uh, my name is Matt Bloomingdale. I'm the assistant director at uh, the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, and my staff a long time ago learned that I should never have a microphone in my hands. So uh, bear with me. <laughs> We're really excited about this presentation and because we feel it's something that can really benefit anyone and everyone, no matter what institution you're at um, and what level um, you are in, in your professional career. Um, what we're going to be discussing today are professional standards, um, namely the Akuhoi professional standards. Um, but just to start out, can we get a little idea of why this session interested you? If one or two people want to give us that, some insight. Otherwise, we're going to start throwing things at people. Yeah. So whether it be NASPA, ACPA, or CAS, um, we're going to touch on the fourth and, and look at it from the Akuhoi standpoint. Uh, but before we get going, we just want to give a little plug. Uh, Professional Standards Institute, this upcoming summer out in Washington State, you get to go out and have an absolutely amazing time at Central Washington University. Matt and I went this past year um, down to uh, Central Florida. Uh, where we had the experience to, or the opportunity to, to go through this experience. It's something we would highly suggest that if you've got the ability to get out there um, and, and go through the Institute, it's, it's something I think that's very eye-opening. Um, it's difficult, it's a, it, it, you do work, um, but it's at the same time very rewarding. Um, there is a little bit more information right now on the Akubo Y website, um, so we would ask that if it is something that you're interested in, that please go and, and look at that because it is something that, that I think for me, from a professional standpoint, has, has really opened my eyes to a lot more. There we go. Uh, so uh, our goal today is really to uh, do three things. One, we want to provide kind of a brief <coughs> overview um, of uh, the SAGs, the standards and guidelines. We're not going to go in depth to all of them, uh, cumbersome uh, and tedious, uh, but we do want to provide a brief overview uh, of how that document is structured. How many people are kind of already familiar with some of the standards and guidelines? How many people not so much wanting to learn more? Great. Okay. Uh, the second thing we'll do is kind of talk about what the difference between a standard and a guideline um, is. Sometimes we use those terms interchangeably, um, but uh, in the standards and guidelines, we, we differentiate them, so we'll talk a little bit about that. And we'll talk a little bit about how you might utilize uh, these standards and guidelines uh, at your institution or in your work um, to become more compliant uh, with the Google Act. Any questions before we get started? Great. So to start things off, one of you had mentioned looking at it from a CAS standpoint. So we're actually going to kick it off as well, just very surfacey, looking at it from CAS. Um, as you can see, CAS has 12 different standards that they look at when um, looking and evaluating a housing and residence life program, um, ranging from mission and program down to facilities, equipment, assessment, and evaluation, um, and anything and everything in between that you can really think of um, with, with, the, with the programs. Um, please note that this was really heavily revised in 2012, um, so there are some previous versions out there that may look a little different than what, what the current version is. Um, but, but this is this is what we start with, and then we're going to transfer to show you the differences um, with the Akuhoi version. So the Akuhoi standards and guidelines were really developed to outline best practices for institutions or specifically departments of, of housing. Um, and so the, the mission is uh, to kind of um, provide a document that can be used um, in multiple ways, uh, but to help you kind of benchmark yourself against what a cool eye believes, what we as a field believe uh, to be the best uh, practices, um, standards, and guidelines uh, for um, for our work. Um, the 
there are four major components to the AQI standards. Um, there's a mission statement that talks about kind of what our mission is um, from a housing perspective. Um, there's uh, the functional areas, which we'll get into in a little bit uh, more in depth. Um, and we'll talk about those. There's uh, five functional areas. Um, and then ethics. Ethics kind of um, splits into two sections. Uh, it outlines what it means to be ethical um, in our profession. And then it also uh, talks about what are ethical hiring practices. So um, what should you do in terms of job posting or what's an appropriate timeline for job posting or how do you notify candidates about positions? Um, and so it does an excellent job of kind of outlining what we should be doing as a field. Finally, there's a qualification section and that section kind of outlines what the preferred qualifications should be for individuals who are doing various things within um, our, uh, uh, our, our work. And so if you have um, a hall director uh, position, an assistant director position, you can kind of go on to that document and look at, um, okay, what does this person do? What does this position do? And then uh, what, what, what are the qualifications, the preferred qualifications for, for those types of So to start it off, looking at functional areas, uh, as you can see, there's six of them that, that we look at within um, the AQI uh, standards and guidelines, the, the professional standards. Uh, business management, uh, student learning and development, um, which is actually a new title for this section, uh, residential facilities, food service, emergency preparedness, and public-private partnerships. Now there's, there's probably a pretty good chance that you're not going to encounter all six at your institution, depending on, on what your functional area is. Uh, but there is, is more than likely a really good chance that you're going to hit a hit among the first three and the fifth one. Um, food service, depending on where you are, may or may not be within your area. And then if you are working with public private partnerships, you may or may not have that one as well. But for, for the other four, those are ones that I think in, in our discussion and, and, and just in looking at it, um, no matter if you're just a residence life type of, 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 of operation, or a housing standalone or a housing and residence life, you're going to see um, those four. Uh, so taking a look at the first functional area, it's business management. We're not going to go through each of these subcategories, but the goal is to kind of provide you some context about which um, uh, what uh, um, are some of the, the things that we're discussing when we're talking about with these functional areas. Um, and so business management is broken down into several. Um, this is where we're talking about planning, personnel, budgeting, accounting, finance, um, contract administration, services. So like what type of services are we providing in our residence halls? What type of services should we provide be providing in our residence halls? Um, Standards and guidelines of it refers to conference administration, evaluation, technology. Um, and so each of these are subcategories that each have standards and guidelines under the functional area of business management. So you can kind of think of it from like a hierarchical perspective. And to give you uh, an example. So looking at it from a business, business management technology standpoint, you can see there there's four different um, sections that it's broken down into. I'm not going to go read these one by one, but it'll give you an idea of things that, that we look for when we look at it from a, a standards and a guideline standpoint. Um, so that staff has access to adequate technology resources and the for performance of their job duties. If you're an assignments coordinator, there's probably a decent chance you need some sort of computer to do your job, whether you have an online assignments um, uh, program or even if you're just keeping track with an Excel spreadsheet and you're still doing things by paper in hand, um, that's what those type of things are referring to. Um, making sure that that what you're supposed to be doing, you're able to do based on the technology uh, resources that you have available. And hopefully you all have uh, a copy of the standards and guidelines so you can kind of follow along. If you don't, these are also available um, on the AQI website. In fact, if you Google AQI standards, um, there's a PDF, I think it's the second result. Um, that will walk you through these, um, these standards and guidelines. Uh, the second uh, functional area is student learning uh, and development. And as was alluded to um, earlier, uh, this is kind of a new um, topic, uh, a revised uh, topic for us that kind of embodies, um, or is it more in line with what we kind of are, are doing, what we are doing, um, perhaps uh, versus what we were doing 
uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago as it, as it relates to um, student development and learning. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, us are moving towards residential curriculums, et cetera. And this section has been revised to kind of um, uh, be, be in line with those types of trends. Uh, so everything from planning and assessment, academic, academic initiatives, uh, personnel development, community development, policy and procedures as it relates to community development, even some things on advising. So if you're advising students um, in RHA and NRHH, uh, it has uh, guidelines um, and standards that we should be um, adhering to uh, when working with our students. So looking at it for, for some examples, um, utilizing theories and knowledge of student learning and development during creation and planning. So being purposeful and, and um, what we're doing, what we're planning, we're not just doing a program or creating a living learning environment just for the heck of it because someone says, hey, we think all the nursing students need to live on the floor. There needs to be a reason why we're doing that. Um, so going back to the residential uh, curriculum standpoint, looking at it of, of why we're doing this, how it's impacting the students, but then also um, how we're able to help them um, move on and transition um, within, within um, the university as well. Um, but that's some of the ideas of, of looking at it, um, considering student developmental theory. It's, it's a common theme within this one. Um, it's, I think, giving a lot of um, a lot more credit to our profession and that, that we, we do have an academic base and that we do um, draw on theories in what we do. And like I said, it's not just we're deciding to do this just because it sounds good or because I like it. Uh, residential facilities, this is more of the same, and so uh, the subcategories here have to do with uh, maintenance and renovation, um, custodial care, uh, construction, so if you're going through a construction process or you have grounds underneath you, uh, what are the standards and guidelines that you should be um, adhering to uh, to be in compliance? And I think even with this one, even as a residence life person, um, we oftentimes deal with our facility side, so it's really important, I believe, to understand these. So, so looking at a, a preventative maintenance program designed to realize or exceed the projected life expectancy of equipment and facilities, uh, program designed to provide emergency response 24 hours a day. You know, I'm a residence life person looking at it from that standpoint. Um, oftentimes it's our staff who's the first one contacted because of an emergency. So them having the understanding and knowledge of being able to know, okay, I just had a toilet blow up. Who am I supposed to call? Is it police? Is there a facilities number? But having that clearly delineated through the ranks so that it's it's not one of those things where if something catastrophic happens, massive damage does occur. Uh, emergency preparedness is one. Uh, unlike some of the others, there aren't really subcategories. There's six um, guidelines that are outlined here, excuse me, six standards that are outlined here, and an additional guideline um, uh, is, the, is the seventh bullet point. Um, but take a uh, campus uh, leadership role in defining uh, what an emergency is, uh, really having outline plans for um, emergency response situations, whether it be inclement weather, uh, active shooter, et cetera. Um, and so this might be a good document for you all when developing your emergency preparedness plans uh, to identify what is it, who I believe we should be doing. Uh, Public-private partnerships, as I said earlier, this is this is a newer one. Um, looking at the, the five different um, standards that are involved here, um, or, or subsections, the, the planning and personnel, uh, procurement purchasing, um, if you're, you're doing a public-private partnership and you're building a new residence hall, um, is purchasing going on within the university? Is it going on through your, your public-private partnership? Who's responsible for that? Um, you'll get the discussions of, you know, will the university can do it because they can get a tax exempt, um, whereas the public-private partnership might not be able to do that, depending on how it's being financed, all of those type of things. Um, transitional structure, development, uh, governance, and oversight. I think that PP31 is becoming more prevalent. I'm in Georgia, um, so uh, we're certainly um, seeing a PP3 influence, a P3, oh, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> A P3 influence uh, in um, in our state. I know the University of Kentucky um, also works uh, collaboratively with EDR, and so uh, it is um, a worthwhile um, or it's worth your time to go ahead and review those, especially if you um, are in a state um, like Mercer who's entering into uh, well, Mercer doesn't have. 
But uh, if you're in the state of Georgia, um, it, it might be worthwhile. Uh, so we're talking about standards and guidelines. Um, standards uh, are kind of the must do's in order to be in compliance with a cool law. Um, they're uh, highly suggested. Uh, so we'll talk more about those. As you go through the standards and guidelines, you'll see that standards are in regular base type. And then we also have guidelines. Guidelines are additional things that Akuai believes that we should be doing. Um, they're not as um, strongly recommended as standards, um, but they are things that are worth consideration, especially after you've uh, been in compliance uh, with the standards. Those are italicized in um, the, the standards and guidelines. And so as you're going through those and you see uh, standard, that's regular face, if you're seeing um, a guideline, those will be in uh, italics. Uh, so for example, um, a standard is uh, collaborate with residential student groups and student organizations to assess needs of constituents. Kuai says this is a standard in order to be in compliance with the standards and guidelines. A guideline support programmatic goals of residential student groups and student organizations by renovating and enhancing physical space to accommodate student needs and or uh, student organizational needs. And so this is um, a guideline. It helps. Um, it's certainly encouraged, um, but it isn't necessarily uh, deemed a standard by a tool line. So another example of a standard versus a guideline, um, there must be at least one professional staff member responsible for the administration and coordination of the department. This person must be knowledgeable about the goals and mission of the program. Basically, they're saying that we need to have a director, a CHO, someone that is responsible for the day-to-day -day oversight of anything and everything that you do with that department. <coughs> and kind of see why that's kind of a, a must-have, I, I would believe. Um, whereas a guideline is uh, hiring practices are consistent with institutional personnel policy and whenever possible are intentional and employing staff that are reflective of and appreciative of the diversity of the student body. So we've acknowledged that we have to have a staff member in this, this type of position. Now, what can we do to make sure that, that we're being reflective and we're being cognizant of, of what our student body is and what their needs are? So a guideline is, is, is let, let's make sure that, that we look at all facets of our hiring process, where we advertise, um, how we advertise. Um, are we just doing internal promotions? Are we doing a nationwide search? Um, any of those types of things, but making sure that's also consistent with, with what our institution um, does within their hiring search. We just can't go out on our own and, and um, you know, do things. However, we still have to follow the, the guidelines within um, each of our institutions. And one more example providing some context. Uh, a standard is provide student leadership opportunities. Um, a guideline would be provide community service opportunities. So the guideline kind of takes it a step further um, and articulating what type of leadership opportunities um, that we should be providing or additional opportunities we should be providing to our student leaders. I think there's one more. Topic. Yep, one more. Um, a program exists to ensure that the housing grounds, including streets, walk, recreational areas, and parking lots are attractively maintained and include safety features. Um, whereas guidelines create gender, gender neutral specific housing where feasible, um, and new facilities and substantial renovations take into account universal design principles. Um, so looking at it from a standard standpoint, um, making sure that our areas are safe, that they're attractive, um, that, that they have a, a program to maintain them. Um, if you're in an area that gets snow and ice, that if, if that happens, that there's a plan to make sure steps are covered uh, with salt, um, any of those type of things, those are must-haves. Whereas some guidelines are, um, Looking at creating gender neutral specific housing where feasible. Um, some schools um, have started doing this. Um, I believe we've even had some programs here at the conference talking about that. Um, and then looking at where new facilities and substantial renovations can take into um, account universal design. So looking at the overall ecology of the buildings, um, how you can use those um, renovations and, and design to, to really make sure that you're taking into account all of your guests, all of your visitors, all of your students and constituents that may you utilize or live in that building. Um, sometimes that may be something that could be cost prohibitive based on your budget to your renovation or your, um, your, your new facility design, but if at all possible, the encouragement is there to look at it. 
Uh, so hopefully now you understand that there are uh, functional areas that each have subcategories, and those subcategories are made up of standards and guidance. Is that pretty clear? Does anybody have any questions on that? Okay. Um, so there are a number of ways in which you might be able to utilize the standards um, regardless of your position within the organization. Um, you might do it as a part of a program evaluation, so looking at your residence-like program and evaluating it um, against uh, the standards and guidelines might be uh, one way uh, to do that. Um, staff training, uh, we've started to look at this at Georgia Tech, but like how are we training our professional staff members um, against the, uh, the guidelines that are outlined, or excuse me, the standards that are outlined? Uh, if you have a graduate preparation program, there are some standards and guidelines that will be applicable to you. Um, so if you're reviewing those programs, um, it's worth considering the standards and guidelines as well. Assessment, um, if you're creating an assessment plan, there are a number of guidelines that actually, a number of standards and guidelines that uh, outline um, when you should be doing assessment on what and how often. And so uh, how often should you be um, assessing your uh, student satisfaction in regards to your facilities. And so as you're creating an assessment plan or thinking we need to do some assessment, uh, looking at the standards and guidelines uh, could be a great resource for you. Um, establishing benchmarks against best practices. And so Akuai has done an excellent job of outlining these best practices, taking a look at how do we measure up against those best practices. Um, and then goal setting and strategic planning. And so if you're kind of at a point in your organization where you're starting to think about, uh, you know, we've just finished our five year strategic plan, it's time to start thinking about our next five years, um, where should we start? Uh, go ahead and utilize the standards and guidelines to see where you're at, measure up, and then identify goals that might be pertinent so that you might be uh, more in compliance with the standards and guidelines. Uh, so there's a number of ways in which you can incorporate the standards and guidelines um, at your institution and your department. So some of the purpose of the self-assessment guides, the SAGs, um, and just as a side note, um, just got an email a little bit ago today that the most updated version of the SAG is going to be released here real soon. Yeah. So the one we're going to pass around shortly to look at is going to be replaced, um, but it's going to give you a very good idea of um, what it entails and, and what you're going to have to go through. So, so looking at it from the standpoint of what is the purpose of, of a self-assessment self guide or a SAG, um, it's basically going to be your step-by-step walkthrough of how to do that assessment or, or that evaluation of a program. Um, when, if you want to pass it down now, um, it's 46 pages long, so that's why we didn't print one out for everyone, um, because we know there's weight limits on airplanes and things like that for luggage. <laughs> Um, plus, we're trying to save some trees and, and do all of that. Um, but the, the most current one, before the, the updated one, that's that's the long link on there. It's, it is in your, your presentation. So if you want to go look at it, you can look at it. Um, but it's going to literally guide you and walk you through every step of performing um, a review, whether it's a, a self-review, an internal review, um, or what even an external reviewer would be looking at as they go in. Um, you can see it, it's quite in depth. It really doesn't leave any stone unturned. Um, and, and it does really um, give a great, great, uh, not only quantitative look at it, but um, from a qualitative piece as well. Um, so uh, it, as was mentioned, the self-assessment guide uh, is available on the QOI website. Uh, we just got an email that uh, the new one should be up uh, within the week, it was just recently approved, um, so good news. Um, and it allows you to really translate the standards into a self-study. And so if you're somebody who's like, we really should be looking at our program from a holistic standpoint and measuring ourselves against these standards and guidelines, um, this document <coughs> is really honed um, to be a tool to allow you to do that um, as simply as possible. We'll, uh, it's, the current one's being passed around. We'll go, we have some slides that will go into that as well. Um, so, so looking at it, um, some, of the, some of the things that, that it looks at is, is the role of the rater, the rating scale, um, assessment criteria, um, documentation to go along with it. Um, one of the things that we, we didn't talk about as well is, is the SAG is a great, great uh, tool to use if you're just looking at 
one specific area. You're not wanting to do a huge review, but you just want to see how one portion of your of your department or, or functional area is doing. You can look at it and see what the expectations from a Kubo I are. Look at it from a much more uh, micro um, level, and then do things from there. So you know, you, it's great to be able to do it from an entire overview of your department. But if you do want to just look at things from from piece by piece, that opportunity is there as it gives you that great guideline. Um, and with, within there that you could follow along with. Um, one of the things I didn't ask at the beginning, has anyone in here gone through Professional Standards Institute? No? Okay. We are going to ask what your experience was like, but. Uh, that's good, otherwise you should be up here presenting and we should be sitting <laughs> <Yeah>. down. <laughs> so so that's, that's one more piece would be the self-assessment guide. Uh, so if you look at the rating scale, it's based on one through five, and we're going to walk through what those mean because uh, it's in, uh, important for us to understand what a one means, what a two means, etc. Uh, one means non-compliance, and so uh, as you're going through the standards and uh, guidelines, uh, one really means uh, nothing. Uh, uh, <laughs> we are not in compliant. There's no way to really mistake that we are in compliance uh, with the guidelines. Uh, two is minimal compliance. Uh, this is like we've done something without really having done much of anything. Um, so a small portion of the criteria has been met. There's some application, uh, but there may need to be um, a review to uh, identify whether or not uh, we're in compliance. Uh, very few steps have been taken to meet the criteria. Three is kind of partial criteria, uh, kind of middle down the road. And so at least half of the criteria uh, is being met. Uh, we've demonstrated some uh, application and understanding of the guidelines, uh, but we may require some additional planning, training, et cetera, um, before we're uh, wanting to consider ourselves to be fully compliant. Four is sub substantial compliance. You see a lot of fours when you do a review. Four is not bad. Um, it means you've done a lot towards this uh, standard or, or this guideline. Um, that, that there was a, a purposeful use or, or trying to obtain um, this level of, of uh, rating um, is evident there. Um, and then five is, is full compliance. Um, you don't see a lot of these, um, but they, they do come in. And, and when you see a five, it's very easy to pick it out. Um, it's either great literature or just amazing, you know, amazing um, pieces to go along with, with the, the documentation that's provided. And then there is there is the unknown, and that's the we have no clue. It's not there, but we just don't know. And so it's it's one of those pieces that um, you just can't make an evaluation based on the information that's there. Uh, Kevin and I had to do an internal review prior to going of our institution, our organization prior to going to the Professional Standards Institute, and we don't have food service. Um, and I don't work with assignments very uh, closely. So a lot of it required some interviewing on my part, and a lot of it uh, uh, required some unknowns um, on my part as well. Uh, and that's, that's not a bad thing. No. Uh, the self-assessment guide uh, looks like this. So you have the rater, you score, and then there's the assessment criteria. Um, and so uh, this one has to do with business management. And so you'll see, um, does the mission statement and goals of the department um, or uh, the mission statement and goals of the department are consistent with the mission of the institution. Uh, at Georgia Tech, uh, we're pretty close. I'd say um, we're more than half compliant, but I don't know that we're fully compliant. Uh, and so I mark that up for uh, The mission statement and goals of the department are reviewed and disseminated regularly. In fact, we've had a lot of conversation recently about um, these. We're posting, we're postering them um, in a lot of places. We're having conversations about it. And so I'd say that, yeah, we are uh, fully compliant um, in that aspect. And so that might be a way in which you start to go through and assess how you meet each of uh, the standards and guidelines. Uh, the process. So when, when you're looking at the process, there, there's going to be an information gathering piece. There's going to be looking at it from the, the SAG. Um, first thing you can do is, is identify areas of excellence. This is the easiest thing, I think, in my mind, because we all know what we're good at, or, or it's really easy to identify what, you know, if you're doing it from an outside view, um, what someone's good at. Um, and it's always easy to talk about what you're good at and, and write about it. Um, so you're going to do that first. Um, you're going to look at the required actions that, that are needed um, and, and go through those as well. 
um, program enhancement actions, things that you need to be working on, uh, need to make little improvements to, um, and then the plans, how are you going to make those improvements and how are you going to um, uh, take those um, enhancement actions to that next level. Um, so that, that's what you're looking at from the process standpoint. Um, so there's a lot of ways to conduct a self-study. I know that when I attended the Institute, I wanted to come back, do a self-study, take it to my director, put it on his desk and say, here are all the things that we need to be doing. Um, but I've had enough developmental conversations with my supervisor to know that that's probably not the best <laughs> approach uh, to a self-study. So here are some things that you want to think about. Um, establish and prepare uh, a self-assessment team. So think strategically about what individuals at what levels do you want assisting you um, in this uh, self-review? Uh, begin the self-study by reviewing the SAGs individually and rating. Uh, I think this is a great idea in part because we all kind of view things a little differently or we interpret evidence a little differently. Um, so I might rate something a four, Kevin might rate something a three. It's good to do these individually to kind of avoid groupthink uh, and get different perspectives. Um, and then go ahead and identify, summarize, and evaluate the evidence that you have to um, support your rating. After which, um, you'll review any institutional data and resources that you have, identify any discrepancies, and then finally come together to review the ratings of the group, identify your evidence, identify discrepancies, um, identify operational problems in need of resolution. So that's kind of like the first half step um, of review. Um, after that, uh, you start to determine what an appropriate corrective action plan uh, might be. It's worth saying that you really need to have buy-in uh, at all levels of your organization to do this. It's really hard uh, to do this as a hall director or an assistant director if you don't have the support of your director or executive director. Um, and so uh, before you go back and start launching into this, uh, make sure that you feel like you have support uh, top down to, to, to do this. Uh, recommend steps uh, for program enhancement, prepare the action plan, and then finally identify a set of priorities for future action plan and direction. So this is kind of a great way to actualize the standards and guidelines. Uh, one of the great ways um, that I think a lot of people are attracted to after going through and reading the document seeing, okay, uh, what, what, what are we in compliant with? What are we not in compliant with? What do we need to be doing? How can we go about developing a plan uh, to do that? One of the things too, that, that when I talk about beginning from a, a uh, data standpoint, you will be doing lots of interviews um, through this process. You're gonna be talking to pretty much anyone and everyone involved with uh, the program from the students. Um, if there's food services involved, you're working, you'll talk with them. Um, so the qualitative piece is, is just as important as the rating. And a lot of times the ratings come from those qualitative interviews that you're doing. Um, possible uses of the self-assessment guide um, and standards and evaluation. Um, some people could say that you can look at this from an annual basis and, and benchmark and see how you can improve upon. That's a lot of work. Um, if you want to do that, more power to you. Maybe it's one of those things where you're only looking at a certain area. You've had an area that you've been uh, um, struggling with and, and you're wanting to see, okay, we made these recommendations, let's look at it again a year from now. Um, that might be something that might be a little bit more feasible than an entire review every year as well. Um, they're timely, uh, or they, they are, are very time um, sensitive, and, and it's one of those things that they, that they do take a little bit of work. Um, you can use it to develop surveys to reach out to the students based on some information you found out um, you might want to say, oh, hey, let's see what our students think about this and, and go from there. Um, it could be, like I said, going from a food standpoint. You found out that um, these are the hours, these, you know, people aren't necessarily happy with the hours that your cafeteria is open. Um, let's go out to the students and see what their thoughts are with that as well. Um, but those are just some ideas that, that you can use to um, um, possible uses of the guide. Uh, so uh, we wanted to, um, get you all into small groups. And so maybe if you can just huddle around with one or two people next to you and have a conversation on these three things. Um, discuss one or two ways your department has in the past or could utilize um, the standards. I'm sure all of you have many ideas uh, in your head right now. Um, what information about the standards would it be important for you to share with your colleagues? Um, and what is something new you've learned during this presentation? Hopefully you've learned uh, a lot of new things. 
Uh, but go ahead and do that for a couple of minutes and then we'll reconvene and we'll kind of report out. I was at the worst. I was at the worst. I was at the worst. I was at the the That's right. Well, we're hoping that maybe in the next year, by some software read through the live streamer and one box, see the presentation in the next box. But I accept it. Yeah, come on, people. Yes, on the main page. And then later, we'll put you. Yes. Well, you can tell who's how many people are now. So five are now, but it was a, it was eleven um, before the break. <laughs> Uh, so uh, hopefully you had a chance to talk a little bit um, about these questions. Does anybody feel comfortable uh, reporting out? Perhaps uh, one or two ways your department has or could utilize the standards. Our group talked about that a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, but something that really stood out to me was emergency response. Um, that is that's so key and that's so important um, right now. But like, you know, like just having that standard and under, you know having that framework and being able to have that uh, utilize that. Saying here, here's this. We can really put it to practice now. 
Yeah, emergency uh, preparedness is a, certainly a big one on a lot of campuses. And so <laughs> as you're developing those plans, utilizing the guidelines, the standards and the guidelines um, can be really impactful in helping you make uh, best practice decisions. So that's a great example of how you might do it. So, yeah. Um, I'm Chris Ritalow from Florida Keys Community College. We're actually preparing to rebrand ourselves as College of the Florida Keys as we're getting ready to start our first baccalaureate programs. Yeah. Um, and because of the fact that we're a small school and I'm a small department, I'm the only person on campus that works in housing, I'm the only person with housing experience. So I've actually been going through, we were discussing this, I've been going through the standards and the ethical principles and I've been sort of evaluating what our department looks like and I'm attempting to utilize it to display for others that have more decision-making power than I do in, in certain areas, especially when it comes to yeah. um, why these things are important and, and what it is we need to do to get out in front of the transition from a two-year to a four-year program because I think there are certain things that are less concerning for a two-year program than when you step up into a baccalaureate program that expectations are going to be higher. So utilizing this as a guide to sort of build into a four-year residence life program is what I'm really attempting to do. Yeah, I think that's a great uh, way to utilize these, especially if you have a buy-in from your supervisor. So you're able to say, uh, we went ahead and conducted a review. We benchmarked ourselves against the best practices. And here are the areas that we're not in compliance with. Uh, perhaps staffing, uh, we might need, need more. Um, and here's kind of a plan uh, that we thought might be appropriate. Uh, and if you have you know, a VP or somebody, um, an executive director who's on board and supportive of your review, it can really be a great way to validate recommendations as opposed to just going into an office and saying, I think we need this. Um, I think that's one of the, the great things about the standard guidelines that provide a lot of validity. Anybody else? Yeah. We're, I'm Alicia from East Tennessee Place. <coughs> yes. So definitely look at those standards and guidelines and develop different competency part of what we're looking for. Yeah, competency development is another great um, way to utilize the standards and guidelines. In fact, who I has their competencies as well. And so uh, there's a really nice marriage there between the two documents in terms of professional staff training effectiveness. Um, what information about the standards uh, would it be important uh, for you to share with colleagues? Anybody get to this one? It's OK. I'm just going to start calling on people, though. No, they're really available and they're specialized. Because like I didn't really know a whole lot, honestly, you know, like this has been very informative and to me to be able to walk back and say, hey, look at this, you know? Yeah, no, <laughs> honestly, uh, before uh, a couple of years ago, I really didn't have any familiarity or understand with the, the standards and guidelines. And as Kevin uh, said, they're free as well, right? And so here's this great assessment tool that really kind of describes best practices. Um, and it's kind of a, a, a great thing to share with colleagues to say, here's what not I believe, uh, or I was talking to a friend at lunch, and this is what we came up with. Uh, but this is what a cool I believe we should be doing in terms of program development. So that's an excellent, excellent thing to share with uh, your colleagues. Uh, I don't even like that question, so we'll just <laughs> Okay, so one of the things we handed out when you, when you came in was a note card. Um, hopefully you didn't take notes on it or make origami or anything like that. Um, if you did, we would like to see your notes so we can read them aloud um, and then share your origami as well. Um, but what we would like you to do if you haven't done either of those two things is to think back to just some of the things we talked about, look into your um, handouts that we gave you and devise one action item related to standards that you think you may be able to complete in the next 45 days. Um, so something realistic, not adding six new staff members or everyone getting a 22% raise, um, nothing of that nature, um, but something that, that you really think you can complete within the next 45 days um, within your area. And then what we'd like you to do is to write your name and your address on the back. It could be your work address. It could be anywhere where you'd like to receive a piece of mail. We don't always get mail. Um, that's fun. Um, but we would like to resend these back to you all in about 45 days or so um, to see and remind yourself about what, what you were thinking you might be able to reach um, and then for you to be able to assess if you did that yourself. So if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes to do that, um, 
And then what we're going to do is when you leave, um, if you could just set them on the chair in the back, we'll collect them um, from there. So, um, so we'll, we'll give you a few minutes to that. Um, but while you're doing that, does anyone have any sort of questions for us um, that we didn't cover? We do realize this is the 30,000 foot view. Um, like we said, if you're really wanting the in-depth hands-on, Professional Standards Institute is really um, what we would highly recommend. You're going to really dive in. There's a lot of work before you get there. There was a lot of work after you left. Um, each one of our areas, each one of our groups was assigned a different functional area and we were responsible for coming up with the report for that part. And so it was it was a lot of work, but it was it was a lot of fun. We had some great dialogue. Um, we got to see some really neat things, meet some great people, um, and then and then be able to create a, a pretty good report, I think, at the very end, which we were able to, to see and, and with each other. So yeah, if, if uh, you certainly probably don't want to invite Kevin and I on campus to do an external review. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're interested in that, we have some great names for you, but we are not those people. However, if you do have questions, like uh, we're going, we talked about this at the staff meeting, and here's kind of a question that we had about this guideline or this standard, um, or uh, we're kind of unsure what the best approach is in utilizing this. You want to bounce some ideas off of us. We have business cards up here, so feel free to come. Um, and chat with us. We'd be happy to continue this dialogue after the conference because we know once you get into the weeds, um, you'll probably have a, a, a lot of questions. Any other additional questions? Uh, if not, thank you so much for your time. We really do appreciate it. And um, we hope that you're having a wonderful see hub And uh, we hope that uh, your presentations for the rest of the day are as good, if not better, than this one. <laughs> oh yes, we have a question. What's what? What is our program? Five oh six. Five oh six. Perfect. Well, thank you very much for your time. We really do appreciate.